and welcome to the Movie Scramble podcast. You join us on this lovely pretend summer day. It's only early May, but we usually have lots of sunshine. I've noticed that more and more now when we introduce the podcast, we talk about the weather as the first thing we actually do, rather than saying, yeah, we've seen lots of films. I suppose it's just the sort of West of Scotland mentality in that way. At least we're not talking about football, so yeah. You've already, you've already heard the chuckling in the background, and I am joined today by the ever delightful Mary. Hello, Mary. How are you doing? I am really good, and once again, super excited that we are discussing the film we're discussing today. I think we're going to have loads to chat about, and yeah, just uh, enjoying my bank holiday weekend, and uh, glad to see your lovely wee face. <laughs> Not many people call it we anymore, but thank you very much for that. That's, that's very good of you. As Mary kind of hinted on there, we are going to be discussing a film today uh, rather than one of our specials where we, we talk about something else. Today we are going to be talking about the brand new film Love Lies Bleeding. It's just out in cinemas just now. They found a the body. Looks like you've got your hands full. No regret in this. We'll just need to fight back. I'm gonna tell them everything you ever did. FBI, open up. Are you threatening me? Yep. Now, Love Lies Bleeding is a, I would say, a neo noir type thriller yeah. film. But that's kind of up for, up for debate, and I'm sure we'll talk about that in a few moments. It is directed by Rose Glass from a screenplay that she wrote with Veronica Tofelska, and it stars Kirsten Stewart, Katie O'Brien, Jenna Malone, Ed Harris, Dave Franco, and Anna Baryshnikov. The plot of the film is set in 1989, Kristen Stewart plays Lou, who is a woman who runs a gym in an unnamed town so it's somewhere in dusty America. We're talking about Arizona or Texas or something like that. I kind of think it's one of these more Republican-type states because it's based around guns and all sorts yeah. of stuff <laughs> like that as well. So, but they don't actually yeah. say. Anyway... Lou is working away at this gym where she doesn't own it, but she basically she runs it pretty much on her own. And she bumps into Jackie, who has just come into town. Jackie is a bodybuilder. They basically have a connection right away. They fall in love. And Jackie wants to go off to Vegas in order to take part in a bodybuilding competition. What is going on at the same time is there are FBI agents skulking about in the town looking for dirt on her family, primarily her father, Lou Sr., played by Ed Harris, with the most incredible hair I've seen for about five years. And the plot kind of unfolds from there with the FBI involvement, with Lou's background, with Lou Sr.'s background, and with Jackie's background as well, and everything kind of comes to head over the course of, I would say it's like less than a week that the film actually takes place in between start and finish. Now, Mary, you saw this as the opening of the Glasgow Film Festival this year, and you also wrote the review of it for the site, and we will get into more specifics of it, but what were your expectations and initial thoughts on the film? So I think expectations were really high because Rose Glass had obviously previously directed St Maud, which mm -hmm. came out during that weird period where it wasn't quite locked down. We were allowed to do some stuff. And that was the last thing I ever saw at the cinema before we went into lockdown again was, was St Maud, which really sort of shocked me to my core as it were as to how mm -hmm. sort of graphic and, and creepy that was and so I went in I don't know maybe expecting something of a kind of similar vibe because the trailer gave absolutely nothing away and this couldn't be more different in terms of just even like the, the level of casting the cinematography the sort of themes it's, it's a very sort of 
different type of film. So Rose Glass is cl clearly setting out here that she's not a not a one trick pony or certainly not a one style pony when it comes to to cinema. And I'm really glad that I saw it in a in a full house because there's lots of moments of of dark humour to be appreciated. There's lots of quite shocking moments that sort of evoked a reaction as well. And yeah, it's one of the best opening galas I think I've seen for for quite a while, just in terms of how. Mm -hmm. A uh, different it was. I it's one of these films that I almost feel is hard to describe because there's so many different things going on, and I feel it has to be seen to be appreciated for how good it is. Yep, I would agree with that. It didn't give very much away in the trailers, like you say, and I think that was a very good thing because yep. you didn't have an idea apart from the kind of tone of the film, and for me it really delivered because right from the sort of opening gambit of it with Kirsten Stewart with her hand down the toilet trying to <laughs> clear off a blockage oh, yeah. which was going to uh, but she didn't she didn't flinch at all and you kind of get the idea that this isn't this isn't her first rodeo in the toilet yeah. this is this is something that happens regularly which kind of makes sense because especially in a gym setting you have an awful lot of protein floating about in people's yes. guts, so <laughs> the, it tends to come out all at once in these places. So yeah. it, it can be a bit of a hazard actually having a toilet in these places. So yes, I like the idea of the cast because it was a mix of people who have very good track records in that, Ed yeah. Harris and Kirsten Stewart, yeah. and it had people that I had never heard of before particularly Katie O'Brien. I know she's yeah. been in a few things, but this is quite possibly the highest profile role that she Yeah, and seemingly, played. so Rose Glass obviously did a wee &E after the, the opening gala, and I think they were really struggling to cast that mm -hmm. part, because obviously there's a, a certain physical demand of, of the, the role yes. of, of Jackie, which I'm sure we'll get into, but I'm pretty sure she said they were only a few days out from actually starting shooting before they realised, and I think it was through Twitter that somebody tweeted Katie O'Brien and said, like, you should go for this casting call, like, this seems perfect for you, and then that's mm -hmm. how they sort of connected. But, like, we sort of said in different moments like that, I always quite like, because you assume that, you know, it was really easy almost in a way to find this particular type of person so it was interesting to even hear that process that it was almost a kind of fluke that she that Katie O'Brien even knew that Rose Glass was looking for this particular you know look and how that all sort of came together because she's she's totally perfect in the role. Okay well since we're actually here already we may as well jump into the the characters themselves the primary characters as I've said are Kirsten Stewart and Katie O'Brien as Lou and Jack or Jackie what did you think of them since they were the central point of this film everything kind of revolved around their relationship yeah. what do you think of them and how they were on screen together so i think their dynamic was was incredible like like you said you know you get this this first sort of meeting with with lou as she's got her hand down the toilet and that you know everything that she does in that gym you can tell was a lot of respect for for her now, whether that's because of who she is or who her father is, obviously that kind of all unfolds as the, as the film does. But you get this sense that she's sort of no nonsense, but also really bored because she obviously lives in this, you know, but fuck nowhere where maybe even, you know, it's the late 80s. So you're not even sure like how open she is about her sexuality, although she's obviously visually coded as quite, quite masculine, I would say. Mm -hmm. And so when she meets Jackie, who she sort of sees as an equal, but equally as a sort of dream girl you know there's often moments where you see Lou just simply gazing at, at Jackie and we're taking in Jackie's body the way that that Lou does as well which is through these obviously rose tinted glasses where she just thinks she's absolutely you know physical perfection so it's one of these things where it's a I don't want to say toxic relationship because it's not quite there's a lot of toxic attachment styles which sort of peppers throughout the film but it isn't a healthy relationship either as you sort of realize as the, as the film progresses but both Kirsten Stewart and Katie O'Brien bring very different things to their their characters. Like Lou is has these like really funny throwaway lines, which Jackie doesn't have because although they're both troubled, Jackie seems to be from the offset. From the minute we meet her, she's basically having sex with someone in a car in order to have somewhere to stay for the night. So yeah. she's got her own problems, but it feels like slightly more serious. So they're both on sort of different paths, but they're 
their personalities are sort of draw them together their love story feels very viable like I feel like it's very rare that in particular um lesbian relationships aren't sort of fetishized on film and I think that this feels like a very sort of genuine match it's not it's not a hopeful match where they're going to ride off into the sunset. It does all feel sort of like kind of grimy and, you know, it, it's not going to end well. But I do think that their dynamic together is absolutely fascinating. And in terms of like how they play off each other, I think it's absolutely perfect. You've got, you know, Jackie, who is the kind of straight man in this, who's going through her own path. And then you've got Lou, who has the sort of throwaway lines, the wee bit of humour, but equally she's got a lot of problems as well. And it's it's fascinating how they're drawn together and how they sort of, plot to get out of town basically because like, that yes. the, that's the goal yeah pretty much that's the end goal that they are able to escape because they're both in a way running or attempting mm -hmm. to run from something they're, and they're doing it in their own ways now we could go into that and obviously spoil the plot and some of the outcomes and some of the background but we won't do that because that's that's what bad people do and we're not yeah. bad people I like the fact it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like the fact that, like you say, it was a bit of a strange relationship. It was almost like a, a convenient relationship. They saw something in each other that they mm -hmm. were able to use in order to get out of town. Now, if they could do that together, that was ideal. Mm -hmm. I liked the fact that, in a lot of ways, Jackie was the more feminine character mm -hmm. because Lou had been through some shit and she didn't kind of care how she looked her hair had been cut like really badly and everything and that's the way it's that a she bad just wanted. mullet yeah it was it's a, a bad, bad mullet, mullet yeah. so <laughs> yeah. but like jackie had a perm and yeah. she was wearing clothes that actually showed off her physique mm -hmm. not in a, a sexual way it's a, it's the kind of clothes that bodybuilders would have worn yeah. in the, the late Back 80s, the 80s early yeah. 90s yeah. as i will talk about later on when we talk about our top threes because there's a, yeah. there's a wee crossover there but in a lot of ways she was the more feminine character because she had like a like she had a permed hairdo and even though she was like well jacked that was her name as yeah. well she, she was pretty well built she gave off more of a, a feminine vibe than Lou who just gave off this anger it was <laughs> it, it wasn't done in a way that you know, made her look sympathetic or glamorous or anything. It was very dirty. Well, you, I mean, you can't get much dirtier than working in a place like, yeah, like like a sort of a an old gym, which is, you know, functional but is still run down, and it's basically just a big warehouse more than anything yeah. else. Yeah, I did, somewhere. I did love the opening shots of the gym though because. Well, one, I, I liked how they used sound. You just heard everybody's, like, breathing and the sound of, like, you know, yeah. muscles squeaking and things like that. But then what I also loved as well, it was, it was it went full 80s immediately. It was, like, chest hair and moustaches and all this. And you're like, ah, right, okay. You did a really good job of setting the scene very quickly through just a couple of sort of visuals that make it very clear sort of where we are and in terms of, like, geography, but also where we are in terms of era as well. So I quite liked how quickly they did that. Yeah, and obviously with the likes of the gyms in those sort of times, they would be full of these sort of inspirational quotes, like yeah. pain is <laughs> pain is the pain is what is it, you know, the bad stuff leaving the body and all this. Yeah, sort of uh -huh. all I know I've mis completely misquoted that. But yes, it's it, it was it was very interesting that the way that um, that was all done as well. So yes, so we have our main characters there. Yeah. Now, you can have great main characters in a film, and the film is still a bit shite because you do not have the story to back it up. Now, I thought the characters were introduced very well, not just the main ones, all of them, and they all seemed like not relatable people because <clears throat> I can't really relate to, you know, gun toting <laughs> bodybuilders <laughs> in, in yes. like new uh, southern texas or new mexico but what did you think of the way that i mean the first maybe 20 minutes of the film where they introduced all the by, by that point everybody had been introduced yeah did you think that that worked well oh, yeah. badly or 
No, I think that it does it does a lot, if you'll pardon the pun, it does a lot of heavy lifting in the mm. in the first 20 minutes because this is a film where it's not a straightforward narrative because every character has their own thing going on and it's how all these different narratives come together that sort of, you know, how the, the whole film sort of culminates. But very quickly, you know, you've got, for example, you know, Dave Franco, who is just odious like does a tremendous job of just being a complete and utter bastard in this film and very quickly we see his dynamic with Jenna Malone who plays his wife and immediately you know for all they've got like their Formica tabletops and their perfect little you know perfectly clean little wee house you can see that that relationship there is obviously one that is violent he's obviously you know abusive and he's obviously going out and doing whatever behind his wife's back and then you've got Ed Harris <laughs> I swear to God, those hair extensions must have been about four foot long and they will live in my memory forever. But you, he's almost built up in a sort of mythological sort of way because how we meet him initially is, well, one, on the gun range, but two, through Lou's flashbacks. So it builds up this idea that he is this sort of small town tough guy and everybody's really scared of him and he has all the power. So I think that between the, the sort of script and the visuals that we see, it does a very, very good job of establishing exactly what's going on, who you're rooting for. I say who you're rooting for, maybe you're not picking a side in this film because nobody's particularly flawless but it does a very good job of saying okay these are the three or four different storylines and this is how we're going to pull this all together I think eh, they do a very good job of that coincidentally eh, Veronica Tofilska who is the writer on this with Rose Glass directed the first four episodes of Baby Reindeer which of course is the huge Netflix hit at the moment which is also a bit dark and humorous in some parts as well so clearly that's a, a thing she has going on in her work I've not seen Baby Reindeer yet. It's on my list to watch and I've been recommended it by, I think, well, obviously yourself has said, but Mm -hmm. there's been at least two other people have said, you should really watch this. It's really good. It's it's one of these ones that seems to be getting quite a lot of traction in terms of people talking yeah. about it. And obviously there's been a lot of media stuff about it as well. So anyway, going back to the film itself. Now, something that I didn't pick up on initially but when I had a, a bit of a think about it, the title of the film mm-hmm. kind of gives you your three-act structure, which I didn't realise. So you've got love, lies, and bleeding. Now, if it was commas in between, that would be obvious. But that's basically how the film actually goes. <laughs> and I never realised that. Uh, did you think on it that way or... Or am I just talking absolute mints? No, but now that you've said that, like the penny has seriously dropped because when we obviously went to the opening gala, uh, Rose Class said she wanted to call it Macho Sluts after the pulp novel that you see Lou reading in the film. But actually, you're so, so right. I never even thought about that because she takes it, well, it's the name of a plant, isn't it? Love Lies Mm. Bleeding, which, yeah. But you're so right. That perfectly sums up how this film is going to go. I'd never even thought about that before. That's insane. Yeah, the, it comes from a, a poem as well, I think, and it's all about putting yourself in the sort of firing line, putting yourself forward. You know, if you're mm-hmm. loving somebody, then you're sacrificing yourself for them. And it's also the name of a Thompson Twins song, which had been bouncing about my head ever <laughs> since I heard Love Lies Bleeding as well, which is kind of bizarre because it's like one of these rhyming couplets. I've got this feeling that my love lies bleeding. And that's just been, that's we tiny. Oh, look, you've got an earworm. Yeah. And round uh-huh. and round. And it's been uh-huh. so annoying. Yeah. But I thought, obviously, there are no mistakes yeah. in films, especially with writing. And I kind of thought that's something that perfectly describes how the film, and it, and it works in that way because the initial was the setup of it they actually fall in love and they do actually fall in love and they tell each other that they fall in love and this is only after about 30 minutes and then it's all the problems that come in all their own separate baggage Mm -hmm. Lou's relationship with her father why she's pretty much estranged from why she doesn't talk to him why are the feds asking her about her dad this kind of thing as well and then obviously bleeding just describes pretty much any third act that's a thriller yeah. and it's in a small town and there's lots of people with guns yeah. you know yeah. so there was obviously other elements that were brought into this include which we will talk about body transformations as mm-hmm. part of this, this discussion later on uh, examples of it now 
body transformation features quite heavily in this film in that you're talking about the bodybuilding world so there is scenes of bodybuilding competitions and stuff where people are doing all these unnatural poses and they're, they're getting all tanned up i always think of stuff like for swarfiga and things like that the stuff the kind of stuff they used to put on fences all this dark brown stuff <laughs> <laughs> it's that kind of color yeah. and also quite early on we get introduced to the fact that as a sideline lou does steroids yeah. and introduces jackie to it which has a dual purpose one that it helps her develop even more and even quicker mm -hmm. she can train harder and everything but also it's a drug and she's almost taking drugs now she says no no i don't want to take this i stay clean but as soon as she takes it it has a, a physical effect on her and it has an emotional effect on her. And you can almost hear like, the muscles start to crack and things like that. Oh, you that. can. So, and I, I thought that was really well done. It was like you, this sort of like engorged sound where you can hear like skin stretch and the veins yeah. are popping through. That was kind of like almost sort of body horror-esque. But it was just, I, I really liked how every so often, it, it wasn't used a lot, it, it wasn't sort of overkill, but every so often they would just focus on how Jackie's body was reacting to whatever it was she'd, she'd taken, in this case, steroids. And I thought that was really well done because it sort of almost sort of, it, it, I'm not saying she was turning into a monster, but you were sort of expecting her almost to sort of like burst out of her skin because that's what we're so used to in these type of films mm -hmm. where something bad is lurking underneath there. But no, I thought it was really, really well done how they sort of used sound and a wee quick visual just to make you see that's her taking the next round of steroids or that's her, you know, it was, it was really well done. Yeah. So I mentioned at the top of the programme about this being a sort of a neo-noir. Would you agree with that, I know I sort of stated that, but would you agree with that? No, no, I definitely think so. I think that visually, it's it's coded in in that sort of way as well. I think the only thing that sort of would you would kind of disagree with that is that sometimes it felt sort of Coen Brothers esque mm -hmm. with the the humor, and you know, I'm thinking of, you know particular scenes of people being rolled up in carpets at, at various points. <laughs> There's a, there, you know, it's not easy to lift a body, as Alfred Hitchcock said, and it should look that way. And they, de you know, Rose Glass definitely nails that in this particular film. But I think that I would say neo noir definitely visually it's it's definitely coded in that way. The only thing that would take you out of that sometimes was these moments of of black humor or almost sort of like sardist moments where things would happen. You know, towards the end of the film in particular, where you're just kind of going, "Huh, did not see that coming." That like, just visually it just was so different, but. Mm -hmm. I, I feel Neil Noir is definitely the label it's going to get. It's got that sort of pulpy, synthy, Clint Mansell soundtrack, you know, that lends itself to to that sort of, you know, everything's all sort of like swathed in, you know, different shadows or different sort of colour palettes that it all feels sort of like sweaty and, you know, dusty and all that sort of thing. So it definitely lends itself to that. But as I say, there's a couple of moments of sort of humour or strange visuals where you just think it's almost kind of magic realism in a way, which mm -hmm. kind of takes you out of the, the neo-noir style, I suppose. Yeah, there was a lot of it shot at night as mm -hmm. well. And those elements were very effective because it gives that sort of noirish tinge oh, yeah. to Yeah, it. you've got gorgeous, like the sky is like ink. And then you've mm -hmm. got like the neon sign of the gym and then seemingly sort of, you know, endless miles of motorway or freeway, whatever uh, Americans would call it. So it does, it looks like a, you know, it looks like an Edward Hopper painting. It's, it's very much that type of vibe that they're going for. Um, but as I say, there's a couple of moments that maybe sort of pull you out of that and it does something quite unexpected and quite different. Okay. Speaking of sweaty, dusty and dark, <laughs> what did you make of Ed, Hor Ed Harris's choices in this film? Oh <laughs> so, yeah, like I said, Rose Glass had a Q&A after, after the screening at Glasgow Film Festival and she said that he'd been cast in the film, he was really excited and then he literally just turned up one day with like four foot hair extensions and was like, yeah, my wife's hairdresser did this for me and he looks like tales from the crypt keeper it is mm -hmm. the most bizarre but see in saying that though it makes perfect sense for the character you know he's he's obviously appearances matter to him who he is in that town matters to him yes and so you can kind of understand why and let's be honest it's the 80s in america in this sort of dust bowl town fashion is probably it's not come down that way yet so mm -hmm. his extremely long beautifully blow-dried 
long blonde hair and his double denim or whatever he's rocking it does actually make sense for the character and it's because it's quite uncanny as well like you don't usually see a guy with a fully bald head and literally five foot of hair down his back I think because it's quite uncanny it does make you very nervous around the character as well because it's Mm -hmm. just why have you made that choice with your hair and you have a gun in your hand like this is all making me feel very uncomfortable so I think that you know, I've talked quite a lot about how characters are, are sort of coded in this in this film. And even to a certain extent, you know, Dave Franco's character is very coded as the sort of classic 80s, you know, all-American guy who obviously is a bastard. But I think Ed Harris's choice here is definitely a a strong one in the sense that who who he is and what he looks like matters to him and he thinks this makes him look good. And nobody's going to, let's be honest, the type of character that he is, nobody's going to make fun of him for it. So it's that kind of really bold choice of, yeah, go on, say something about my hair. (laughs) Yeah, for me, that's what it it was. It was a choice. He he was sitting down almost, uh, what would you call it? Like a statement piece, a statement, Uh (laughs) you know, a statement outfit, statement look, if you like. And he's almost challenging people to say something about it. And nobody ever does because none, none of the people in this film are stupid no. some are reckless and yeah. uh, some are subservient but none of them are daft there's no, no. kind of easy everybody's got their guy that can... yeah 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 everybody's got their street smarts and you get the sense that everybody knows and everybody in this town knows how this town works and even Jackie mm-hmm. who's new to the town has obviously had enough issues in her life that she understands quite quickly how things work and who to say what to and what what boundaries she can push and what she can like I think it's it's very you know I mean small town mentality is very much a thing this obviously takes it you know to the next level but I think it's very clear that everybody knows who they're supposed to be and what role they're supposed to play in that particular town. Well on the first evening that she's actually in town she is intelligent enough to figure out who's in charge of the town and how to mm-hmm. get to him. And that is Lou mm-hmm. Sr. He basically runs everything. He's in ch- he basically runs the police, all sorts of things like that. So he she finds a way to get a meeting with him. And then when she has the meeting with Lou Sr., and the first question he says is, do you like guns? And the easy answer would be to say, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, they're fine. You know, I've got no issues mm-hmm. with them at all. She says, no. I don't like them, I hate them, and she's looking for a, a job in a gun range. Mm-hmm. Not actually looking after the guns, but uh, working in the, the bar there. Yeah. And because of her attitude and almost like a truthfulness, that gets her to the next stage and she actually gets a job. Now, you get the feeling that she, this isn't the first time she's done something like that. She's been yes. working her way across the country. and. Yeah. It's probably something that she's learned that in order to... She knows how to gauge people. She understands people, how they kind of work. Not to the extent where she can put together some sort of Machiavellian plan and... No, but it's enough to survive. And And I think that's the the key part of her character is a survival mode, which she is quite clearly in from the offset. Yes, and she is just looking to get to the next place in order to get enough money to, to get her towards... Vegas to this bodybuilding competition so in a way she's kind of using people that she that can help her and she it works very well with Lou Senior because she speaks frankly to him she speaks plainly to him but she doesn't insult him she doesn't call him a joke or anything even though she you can kind of tell that she doesn't like him right from the start and it's for no other particular reason than She's just doing this to survive, like you say. She's it's like flight mode she's in, so she's just trying to get somewhere else. And she needs money. So she's not going to say, Well, you're a stupid old man, you've got really long hair. You know, <laughs> because, and like yeah. nobody is ever going to say that to him because that's like yeah. you say, he's in charge. But yes, I, I found that particularly interesting and quite clever as well. That the way that yeah. they set out exactly what Jackie's character was like from yeah. the very, very start. It's it's interesting now. Unusually for a film, you have both sides of the sort of the, the the problem that films have with female characters. You have two characters 
both female characters who are in very prominently the leads are on the posters everything mm -hmm. is them and you have the jenna malone character of beth who is almost the typical prototypical screen characterization of a, a downtrodden wife she won't do anything about her husband she can't do anything about her husband yeah. because the town's sealed up the police yeah. keep saying oh she she wants to raise a complaint and she has to do it officially and you just know that that's going to be a, a complete you know it's going to be a complete nightmare how do you think they balance that out with the fact that having and and i'm saying this genuinely it can be a real issue if you have a film and your two main characters are female and they're very much strong personalities that can put a certain demographic off going to see a film like this what do you think yeah no i under you know it's interesting i understand this i was having a debate yesterday about female video game characters and yeah. why even strong female video game characters have to look a certain way and what i really love about this film in particular and i think that you know from what we've seen with from rose glass so far is that she is thoroughly committed to writing fully fleshed out female characters so even jenna malone's character in this beth although she is something of a stereotype there is so much more to her story than that that we maybe get through the odd you know glimpse or sort of subtext or or whatever what i think that this is really important is the sense that the two leads are very very strong but they're also not they're not there to be fetishized they're not there to be looked at well they are to a certain extent because obviously it's a bodybuilding competition but what i mean is it's not like you know they don't look like all american girls and i think that's really important because i actually think that this sort of grungy 80s you know sort of outcast kind of look is is what gives these characters their strength as well it would be ridiculous to have somebody who you know looked like margot robbie and barbie saying how terrible her life would be and all this sort of thing there's this sort yeah. of griminess to them that adds that that layer and then ironically you do have beth who is the well-dressed you know hair all perfect the makeup's lovely the, the jewelry's sitting right and her life's a shit show and mm. actually it's she's a character you really you feel sympathy for because obviously she's getting the shit kicked out of her on a regular basis but actually you're very frustrated for her as well because she can't do anything and she's totally trapped in this this lifestyle whereas interestingly these two strong female leads have an out so neither jackie or lou have any real connections to the town other than obviously you know lou's family but she's not particularly close to them so they can leave at any given time but it's not this sort of like well-polished fairy tale it's mm -hmm. very much uh you know kind of it's not even a Thelma and Louise, although there are clear allusions to Thelma and Louise, it's not even like a polished version or slightly different version of Thelma and Louise. It's, it very much feels a lot sort of like toxic and, and, and dirty. But I think that potentially it will put a lot of people off because it's two very strong female leads in the film is, you know, quite definitely about them and their various stories. But actually, what a shame that someone would deny themselves the chance to see such a different and such a well put together film simply mm -hmm. because it is telling, you know, the, the story of, of two two incredible you know incredibly different incredibly sort of othered women not just in you know their sexuality but also the way they look the, the lifestyle that they lead they're very much sort of on the the fringes of of society even you know despite loose family connections so I think that yes I can see why having two strong female characters would put people off but I think I just think you're you're missing out but in, in not coming to see something like this that's telling a, a fantastic story. Yeah, we are always told that cinema audiences are crying out for something new that's not formulaic, it's not part of a franchise. And yeah. then when they're presented with something which is quite a modern story in a way and also one that harks back to sort of hard-boiled thrillers of the yeah. 70s, 80s, 90s, then you may not get an audience for it. It may not actually get a, a massive big cinema release because they don't think people are going to see it which you know what what do people actually want that's it people have to be honest about what they actually want yeah. and if, they, if yeah. they don't want stuff like this then stop moaning about the fact that you're getting the same stuff all the time because that's what's bringing the box in unfortunately so yeah it's it is a wee bit frustrating at times now we touched briefly on the fact that this is Rose Glass's follow-up to Saint Maud. 
what do you think of the the direction and the writing in terms of the progression from the last film? Was it more impressive? Was it surprising? What do you think? I think surprising is the right word. The scale of this is so completely different to St. Mm -hmm. Maud's. I mean, actually, it, the reality is, in Saint, both in this film and in St. Maud, she's focused on women who are almost like in the throes of addiction, but very different types of addiction. You know, how you had the mm -hmm. religious sort of fanaticism in St. Maud, and you have the the sort of toxic love and literal addiction that goes on in, in Love Lies Bleeding. I just think the scale of this seems so much bigger than St. Maud, but I think that what is clear, as, as I've said eh, sort of early on in the pod, is that Rose Glass has one a, a fantastic career ahead of her because how can you deliver two absolute knockouts just straight after you know one after the other incredible mm -hmm. but also she has a clear dedication to delivering really interesting and layered female characters who are yes they're in theory there for you to look at but they're actually not it's, it's about you know their relationships with society or their relationships with their family or even just their relationships with themselves I think that she's clearly someone who is doing cinema differently and actually writing really good female characters shouldn't be doing cinema differently but unfortunately that's the, <laughs> yes. the, the, the state of the world that we're in but she can also do it with a wee bit of tongue-in-cheek which I think you see a little bit more in this film you know St Maud was obviously kind of very horror thriller very intense yes this film is super intense but it, there's also moments where people were really you know laughing out loud because as I say Kirsten Stewart has some cracking throwaway lines in this film where you just think that it, it gives you gives you a breather right from everything else that's going on but I, I really think that Rose Glass has shown that she can do two completely different styles you know but still delivering that really strong narrative and also just really really good female characters as well that are well written fleshed out and not not just there you know to be eye candy or whatever you want to to call it mm -hmm. in a way Looking back, in retrospect, it looks like St. Maud was almost like a calling card of a mm -hmm. film in that it set out exactly what Rose Glass could do in terms of direction and writing. And the fact that that film was a critical success, maybe not in terms of box office or anything, but that doesn't matter in terms of early films from a new talent. What you're looking for there, what a lot of actors are looking for there is someone that they think they can work with. So by bringing out a film, St. Maud, with not like complete unknowns in it, but relative smaller actors, I know they have all been in other things and everything, and showing like a certain dynamic in terms of relationships and how people react together and almost like believable situations in certain ways that attracts other people that attracts money that yeah. attracts the likes of ed harris yeah kirsten stewart to put their names forward in order to back this film in order to get it made now kirsten stewart has a track record since twilight films of pretty much doing what she wants in terms of films and it's all been smaller films it's been european films and stuff where she's playing vastly different types of characters that are always interesting and it's like a lot of you, you would call it art house or yeah. festival type films mm -hmm. that she's obviously lending her name to in order to get them or help get them finance, and that's n in no way putting down the other people who are involved in the films, especially the, the, the directors and writers and stuff, but it doesn't hurt when you have a name attached to it. No, and the thing is, like, with with, with this film, um, you know, you've got Clint Mansell doing the, the soundtrack, so every, mm -hmm. you know, anyone who's seen Drive or whatever is obviously very familiar with his work. You've got Kirsten Stewart in a lead, Dave Franco, who is a, a well-known you know, actor for very, again, for very different films to this, his mm. name is attached to it. You've got, you know, obviously your your Ed Harris as well and, and Jenna Malone, who bizarrely was it they were in Stepmom together and now they're sort of reunited in a very different way in, in this film. So you do have really big names attached to it, but you definitely get the feeling that Kirsten Stewart in particular 
and Robert Pattinson, interestingly, since they both left the Twilight franchise, have made a, a conscious effort to become involved yes. in these sort of... Because I definitely think that for women in particular, these projects give them the chance to do something with a character and to really get involved in a, in a good narrative and to maybe change their appearance slightly or do something different. And I think that for a lot of actors like like Kirsten Stewart, certainly from what I've gathered from you know watching interviews with her and things like that, that's what she's craving. It's that really you know fleshy role to sort of sink your teeth into as opposed to I mean she could she could do a million blockbusters she could do Marvels and all that sort of thing because she was such a big name after after Twilight and she's she's carved out a career quite distinct from that mm -hmm. and this feels like the perfect fodder for someone like her because it is such a like for all that Lou is you know a bit grubby and stuff like that she's also quite cool and quite standoffish and quite aloof and you can actually see elements of Kirsten Stewart in that in her like herself so yeah. Yeah, she's a, she's had a really fascinating career, but definitely having these sort of names attached to it, obviously, that's no disrespect to obviously more than Clark or Jennifer L in the in St. Maud, but definitely these are names that you would probably recognise a lot lot more. More cinema goers would recognise these names. So certainly the, the calibre of the cast in this, you can imagine will have helped tick a few boxes when it comes to signing some checks. Yeah, I mean at the time obviously Morford Clark was relative unknown. She has gone on to do the Lords yeah. of the Rings. Yes, yeah. TV show since then and hey, Jennifer L has had a long career in film and TV so yes I can see why yes this is a, a step up in terms of the sort of recognition level mm -hmm. of the cast but it's still a cast that is indie enough it doesn't have like a, a big headlining star apart from obviously Kristen, Kristen Stewart is but not in the way that she was when it was like Twilight Times you find that an awful lot with especially actors who were quite young in these franchises. Look at the Harry Potter films as well, mm -hmm. the, the three child stars from that. They've done wildly different things. Very little of it has been mainstream. Basically, none of them need to work again ever in their life. And it's the <laughs> same with Robert Pattinson and Kirsten Stewart. They do not need to do... They, they could quite happily do charity work for the rest of the days if they wanted. But obviously... That's not why they became actors. They became actors because it's their passion and it's what, they, what they're good at. And they're both mm -hmm. very good at what they do. Now, Robert Pattinson has obviously moved back more into sort of mainstream stuff, but I think he's mixing it up. So it's it's almost like a big one and a small one. And the big yeah. ones help to keep his name there so that he can do the smaller films and all that again. But yes, it's, it's good. And I, I like the fact that You've got an actor like Ed Harris, who is at the stage of his career where he gives zero fucks. <laughs> he just, the, the last maybe four or five different things I've seen him in, he's basically been playing craggy old man with yeah. serious attitude. Uh, things like <laughs> Westworld and all this sort of stuff. And he's brilliant because he's such a good actor, but he just comes across as being like and it's all pretty horrible characters he plays as well and this is no yeah. different to the previous stuff and i really like that i like the fact that he's just said yep i can do whatever the hell i want i can wear whatever hair extensions <laughs> i want i <I'm> just <laughs> just take it from there i mean hair was a big part of this film oh yeah it's the not, 80s not just, so hair's, yeah yeah, yeah. He, hair was big for most of them like you say there's the, the character Beth, who had the, it was like a, what do you call it? It was like a, a permanent set or something like that. Yeah. Was that uh -huh. kind of idea? Yeah. Yes. So I don't know how I managed to drag that particular hair <laughs> reference up, but never mind. <laughs> Jackie had a perm, full on perm. Kirsten Stewart's hair, though, now this is going to be a bit niche because her hair was all over the place. As, like you said, it was a bad mullet, but yeah. there are flashbacks to this and you you realize that her choice of hair is actually based on events that happened previously yeah. in the film because you see this wee flashback and she's just got this sort of long flowing hair and now it's this you know not giving a fuck kind of hairdo yeah. and there's a reason behind it and if, if you didn't think about it you just think well that's what she's kind of chosen but it's almost as if she's try to strip herself of the person that she was before because she's completely different in the way that she looks to the person that was 
basically, with with well, I'm not really giving anything away, but there's a reason why she's called Lou and her father's called Lou. Yeah. She is the the chosen one. She is a lot more pragmatic. She's harder than her brother, JJ. No, JJ. Mm-hmm. Ah, JJ's the, no, no, JJ's the the husband of... Um, yeah, he's a brother-in-law, yeah. Yeah, so he's the brother-in-law, but Lou's the sort of the smart, smarter one out of the two. Smarter than Beth. More yeah. resilient than Beth. And because of that, because she's very like her father, that relationship between the two of them is very difficult. Yeah. Now, obviously that manifested itself with a subplot round about the FBI floating about and all that. Do you think that kind of worked, though? Do you think they needed something like that? Or do you think they could have got away with the fact that things naturally bubble to the surface anyway? Yeah, do you know, I mean, two minds about that as a, as a subplot. I think because we're introduced to the FBI characters very early on, it does that you kind of go, huh, what's happened here? But because mm-hmm. Lou has all these various flashbacks and, you know, we see... Again, we see who her father is very clearly from the offset as well. I don't know that it needed it because it felt like it was probably going to come to a head anyway. But I yep. think it what it does do is it sets a bit of a it puts a bit of a timer on things. So the clock is ticking immediately in the sense that they are closing in on him. But because Lou is very much her father's daughter, she's closed off and she's, you know, she doesn't give the answers that they want. And despite the fact that she clearly has a very bad relationship with her father, she's not willing to, she's not a grass either, basically. So I do think in a sense that could they have done them without that subplot? Yes. But it's that sense of it does sort of start the timer on things because the fact that they've made it to this small town and he's handed his business card over and he knows exactly who he's looking for. It does set some other things in, in motion. So it's a kind of, ne- it's, it's a sort of necessary subplot, albeit it's, it's one that if, if you stripped it out, you maybe wouldn't lose too much from it. But as I say, it sort of, it starts the clock ticking on things, I think. Yeah, I think I think you're right. It just it brings things to head quite quickly because they've, yeah. they've been introduced. So yes, it kind of works in that way, but could have done without it. It, I mean, the, the film isn't long by any means, so it, it didn't no, add any bulk to it. Yeah, hour. yeah, it doesn't mess about at all. An hour and forty-four. Half. Yeah, mm-hmm. so yeah, I I didn't think that the film had really any flabby bits, any fat no. to it at all. Everything was kind of there for a reason. And that's down to the writing. Now we know from previously from Saint Maud that. Rose Glass is able to bring a film together and it's very tight in terms of the story and how it's told. And I think this just reinforces that. If anything, it's better because she's obviously working with a co-writer on this Mm -hmm. and it's a bigger production. And I am sure the temptation must be there to show off a bit and actually say, look how I've developed. But by keeping to your game plan and still keeping things tight, I think it makes all the difference because I, don't, I for one, I'm looking forward to what she's going to do in the future because I think she's, she's going to have some some career, uh, especially if she keeps switching about in terms yeah. of the type of stories that she tells. Doesn't, like, it would be nice if the next one wasn't a sort of thriller noir. I'm not saying like, she should be doing a musical or anything, but... Uh, <laughs> That would be quite interesting as well. Yeah, I was going to say, but I imagine she did, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we've gone into a bit of depth on the film, chatted about it. Is there anything that you think I have not covered in terms of the film? So I think that, and I sort of reference this in the review, what I really love about this in particular is this whole notion of, of toxic attachment. Yeah. So. Beth can't get rid of her husband in the same way that Lou can't get rid of her father and Jackie can't get rid of her past. And then there's the character of Daisy, who played by Anna Baryshnikov, who is obsessed with Lou mm-hmm. and wants to be Lou's partner and is very, very jealous when Jackie arrives on the scene. And, you know, this notion that they're all sort of trapped in this small town and had they lived in a bigger city, would these relationships be as sort of grim as they are and I really like the fact that the the setting has a big part to play in who these characters are and how they can't seem to shake free of 
of each other. So within yeah. this, you know, as we've said, sort of small town mentality, they're all completely enmeshed. And I thought that Anna Baryshnikov did a really good job with the the small sort of role of Daisy because she's kind of pathetic from the offset and you do sort of feel really sorry for her and she's obviously not as cool and not as confident as, as the rest of the characters in particular obviously sort of Lou and Jackie so I thought that it was really interesting how setting played a huge part in basically how these people can't get rid of each other because obviously it's like you know population five in the town yeah. so there's just no getting away from anyone and even when sort of Lou and Jackie start hanging about together there's that scene where Daisy's like chapping on the, the truck at the traffic lights and it's like, do you want to hang out and all this? And it's like, Jesus, mm -hmm. they're all in each other's pockets. And I just thought that lended itself really well to obviously what Rose Class was trying to explore, which was this sort of, you know, entanglement and how nobody could really get away from each other. And I just, I thought it was really, really well done. Yeah, it's, it's difficult to keep any secrets in a town that's so small. And the, the character of Daisy obviously got really put out because, like, another lesbian came to town. So yeah. <laughs> it was just more And she was the town lesbian. Yeah. yeah. That's what yeah. it felt like. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I thought that was a very good performance because she did come across as being particularly pathetic and yeah. uh, really, really shallow. And if you think that about a character, then that character has been done really, really well by yeah. the actor because yeah. you're starting to think that they must be like that. And, of course, they're never like that. They're just obviously normal people, but they're very good at their job. So yeah. it's something that a lot of people forget, that the actors aren't the same as their characters, unless yeah. well, I mean, you can somebody is... playing the same part for years and years, I suppose. But, yeah, I... Because she was got... like sta a stage down grubby from everybody mm -hmm. else. Like they'd obviously like browned her teeth. Oh, and I, yeah. think, I think that's so jarring because we're so used to seeing people with like really perfect pearly whites, even in films where people are supposed to be like, you know, sort of from these like, as I say, dust bowl towns. And her hair was like two strings hanging down from her face. And, you know, she was just kind of always sort of flushed and her, her mascara was always slightly smudged. And then the first time she smiled, I was like, oh my God. God, a mouthful yeah. of brown teeth and then when I saw the actress on the red carpet with it I was like god she's stunning and I was like why did I think she'd brown teeth no actor in this planet has like a full mouth of like tobacco stained teeth but even just that the fact that they've made her like even grubbier than the rest of mm -hmm. the cast like it just oh it was it was so well done really well done nice nice so this seems to be a bit of a running theme with us but my next, my final question will probably seem a little bit redundant. Would you recommend this film? <laughs> Absol absolutely. I just think that we need, do you know what? It, it's so refreshing to see a film like this and it's challenging and it's engaging and it's, you know, it, it's really different visually. And yeah, if you're fed up with prequels, sequels, franchises, spin offs, and God knows what else, and even if you're just looking for something a bit different, definitely go and see this. Rose Class is clearly a brilliant, brilliant filmmaker and I'm really excited to see what she does next because this is so good. Absolutely. I would completely agree with that. This is a really, really good film and possibly it would be up there in consideration for top 10. Of the yeah. year. We've, had a, we've had a few so far that we've talked about that are very much top-notch films. I think it's going to be an interesting look back at the end of the year if World War Three doesn't kill us all, obviously, before yeah. the end of November. But, yeah, I would recommend this film to pretty much anybody who wants to see something a wee bit different and is open for a, a very good film that they don't really know very much about. Yeah. So, yes. So, following on from our review we are going to take we're going to go back to our format of top threes now for those of you who may not have listened to us before where the fuck have you been you know we've we've been here so why we've been here you? this entire time yeah yeah i've been stuck in the room for years now so we sometimes look at one of the themes or one of the actors or something to do with the film and come up with a top three on 
that particular theme. In this case, we are looking at body transformation. Now, this gives us a hell of a lot of scope with films. The reason we're doing this is obviously there's a whole bodybuilding element and the steroid abuse elements in the film and the fact that it's all got to do with body image in this film. All the main characters, I'm thinking Lou, Jackie and even Lou Senior have a certain body image that they portray. So we have thought about this and come up with three of our own choices. Now, the easy thing to do here would just to be go down the horror route, but yes. we may or may not do that. So, <laughs> Mary, I will give you the first choice. What is your number one, two, or three? <laughs> so, I purposely have stayed away from the horror route for this, for this first one, but this is a film that I have such good memories of watching as a child and even as an adult. So, my first pick is Mrs. Doubtfire. The mm -hmm. Chris Columbus film that obviously stars Robin Williams. So he is an actor who is separated from his wife and she won't let him see the kids. And so in order to spend time with the children, he becomes the sort of Edinburgh light accented Mrs. Doubtfire who is a nanny to his children. And I have such fond memories of watching, in particular, the transformation scene. So he goes round to his brother, Frank, is it his brother? Yeah. And they try on all these different sort of like facial prosthetics and different wigs. And there's this, like he starts singing Barbara Streisand at one point because they give him a bob. But just that very act of transformation, which you get to be privy to, is so, so much fun. And then obviously the film goes on and it's all like capers and chaos as he sort of, you know, sets his boob on fire and all this sort of thing. Or the nose is hanging off and various things like that. So... It's a sort of classic transformation in the sense that it's obviously somebody absolutely burying themselves in various prosthetics and, you know, big pillow boobs. But it's mm. just something that for me has such good memories of, of watching it when I was a child in particular, because obviously Robin Williams was like so funny, so clever, so slapstick, so out there. And yeah, I thought rather than go down the horror route for starters, I thought I'd start off with something a bit light. It's going to get progressively worse from here. But I thought we'll start off with something a bit light. And Mrs. Doubtfire to me is like the ultimate transformation on screen. Yeah. When we started talking about this, I would never have thought about Mrs. Doubtfire at all. And it makes so much sense because it's it, it, it fits the bill yeah. really well. And the, the fact that obviously it's... Robin Williams doing it as well. It's just such a, a good film in general and such a, a clever, clever transformation, especially yeah. with, the, yeah, with the wild Scottish accent and stuff. So, yeah, yeah. so it's all about all about mad and it, it works. It works really well. I'm really, really well. I think particularly because <laughs> obviously he is very good at physical comedy. So the fact that it's a yes. physical transformation and then he's he's sort of getting used to his new body as well, obviously adds mm -hmm. to a lot of the, the slapstick elements. But yeah, as I say, I thought I'd start off with something lighthearted for a change. Yeah. Following on from that, my first choice is Captain America, the first Avenger. Again, avoiding the horror route. It's a 2011 film directed by Joe Johnson, one of the earlier entries in the MCU. It's all about the the origins of the Captain America character. Chris Evans is Steve Rogers in this film, a guy who wants to do the right thing. He's very patriotic, he wants to go to war. This is set just at the, the point in the Second World War where America has joined and there is an initiative ongoing which is the super soldier initiative where they are trying to develop basically these very very strong fighting men and they need candidates for it and through a whole series of circumstances Steve Rogers has chosen to do this and he's put into the big machine and there's lots of smoke and sparks and <laughs> screams from inside this big chamber. And what happens is Steve Rogers is transformed from this very slightly built man into this pretty much a brick shit house when he comes out. 
of course he goes in topless <laughs> which Imagine doesn't do. hurt yeah. and, and somehow he manages to get a light spray tan at the same time because he's all glistening and everything when he comes out but he's got these absolutely he's really really well built when he comes out to the point to the point that um Hayley Atwell in the film when that film was seen and the door was opened she was actually quite surprised because she hadn't seen Chris Evans without his top on so she, she was kind of just like went to touch, <laughs> touch his <laughs> chest <laughs> yeah. because of Hayley that. Atwell speaking for all of us all <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah and the the way that the the whole transformation's done obviously there's a big scene where it's all smoke and mirrors and everything and flashes like I say but the the whole lead up to it is done via CG because they put Chris Evans' face onto somebody else's body, and it, it works really well. You don't think about it too much. It, it seems a wee bit unusual, especially because people were used to seeing what Chris Evans looks like. He was He's always been like a, a fit guy, and by, at, by that point he had been in movies for quite a while. So to see him as a sort of weedy guy was quite unusual, but it worked. And then to see the transformation of him, you know, Ta-da! Captain America. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I thought that worked particularly well. It was, it was, I think it was the first thing I thought of when we talked about when we were looking at yeah. body transformations. It, it's funny because they even just, like, when he's weedy, he's got, like, a front, like, side shed that sort of comes down over his eyebrows. And then when he becomes Captain America, he's got this slicked back hair. So even just, like, a subtle thing like that, like, just moving his hair off of his face mm -hmm. really sort of emphasises the sheer... As you say, the, the brick shit house that he has become. Do you know what's funny? I would have never thought about that, but it's one of the more obvious ones sort of from recent cinema as well, because it was such yeah. a big thing when it was done. Everybody was waiting to see him come out of that pod or whatever it was called. Yeah. I'm nothing if not obvious. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So, your second choice, if you'd like so to share. Now we're taking a dark turn, but it is still a childhood film. So I remember reading the book first and the book didn't scare me. And then I watched Nicholas Rogue's The Witches and I shit myself. <laughs> so <laughs> obviously this is the story of, you know, a little boy who stumbles across a, a conference of witches uh, in a hotel and it's a sort of who's who of sort of British casting you know you've got Bill Patterson, Brenda Blethyn, Rowan Atkinson but obviously the the main witch Miss Ernst is played by Angelica Houston and genuinely that scene is ingrained on my brain where they're all in the conference room and it all starts by like they take off their gloves and then the shoes come off and then eventually she literally you know the wig comes off and the reveals this and Angelica Houston is a beautiful looking woman and then this huge beak comes out she's got a horrible nose even her makeup becomes really garish she's bald she looks sort of slimy and that reveal I just remember being so captivated and so terrified by that because you'd obviously in the position you're watching it as well, you know, alongside uh, the, the characters in the, the film. And it is one of the most haunting moments of my childhood that I always go back to. And I remember they remade the film with Anne Hathaway. And even as an adult, I was like, I can't go back and watch that because it's too scary. But it's such mm -hmm. an effective transformation because it is, it's meant to be terrifying. Nobody, you know, everybody thinks about witches with the, you know, the black hat and the, the green face, the sort of Wizard of Oz type. These were ugly and scary and really different. And obviously there's lots of like prosthetics and makeup involved there. And it just... For me, when we said transformations immediately, I was like, oh, that scene where, you know, Angelica Houston finally takes the wig off. You're like, fuck, mm -hmm. that's scary. So, yeah, that's a standout transformation for me. And I think that it really, yeah, it made, as I say, I think witches often are seen as the sort of like pointy hat, green face. This made them seem like something so much more sinister and so much more threatening. And it's just, it's, it's really well done. It's a, it's a fantastic reveal as far as body transformations go. Nice, nice, good one. I have not seen that film for years. It's been such a long time, but I know exactly what you mean. I had such a crush on Angelica Houston when I was younger. She's gorgeous, just, yeah. <laughs> oh, there's there's photographs of her from the time when she was in a relationship with Jack Nicholson, and she's just just you know, fabulous. And you just think, whoa! And then and, not, and being able to do that sort of and being willing 
to do that sort of transformation? Yeah, I guess that was probably, I mean, this is probably like, if you think about it, it's probably the peak of her career because you've got Adam's family, where, again, where she was just stunning, like the genuinely most mm -hmm. beautiful mortician I've ever seen. But this was like, yeah, as I say, she grows this huge beak. The makeup is like so garish, like the blue eyeshadow goes right up her face and the lips are like a smeary red. And then it's just got like the little fuzzy bits on her head where like she's not quite bald and she just looks like slimy. So yeah, mm -hmm. pro probably a brave choice was probably how it was described back yeah, in the day. Yeah, no <laughs> doubt, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh man, that's good, that's cracking. My second choice is again not a horror film it is the 2000 film from robert zemeckis castaway and i thought it was castaway as in one word but it's not it's two words adding an really? extra level to it yeah I, I thought it was just the one word but it's obviously cast away and the transformation here is the opposite to the the bulking up beefy part where the main character, Tom Hanks, works for FedEx and he is on a plane that is transporting lots of mail from, I think it might be Russia somewhere or something like that. It's, it's somewhere very cold and snowy and the plane runs into trouble and it crashes and he survives on this desert island. He's washed up in a desert island and he finds various packages and starts to use them in order to try and survive more than anything else. The transformation element occurs about 20 minutes or so into the film because of the first of it you see the Hanks character and he's like wearing a big sort of heavy winter jacket and he's got like a big jumper on because it's obviously freezing cold but he, he looks normal he looks like a normal guy he's maybe even just a, a wee bit sort of slightly he's, he's carrying a bit of baby weight shall we say <laughs> <laughs> so he he's, he's just a normal guy but then obviously the fact that the film does all the initial setup and him actually on the beach and start to get ready and then it cuts to like i think it's six or nine months later and the difference and his physique from the time that he actually got off of the beach to the time where he's now fishing. So it's a scene where you see him trying to spearfish and he's and he is emaciated. He is so skinny. It's re it's actually really scary. And it has had health implications for him in later life as well with diabetes and stuff. Mm -hmm. But the transformation is that he has lost maybe like 25, 30 pounds in weight. And, he, you know, you can, you can almost see the bones in his shoulders yeah. and things like that. And he's obviously got this big, long, scraggy beard and everything like that. So it's like a complete transformation. And it's just amazing to think that an actor quite regularly during those times put themselves through mm -hmm. that sort of process in order to make the role real. Now, obviously, yeah. there's like a lot of makeup and things involved, but you can't get away from the fact there's, no, there's only so much you can do with that sort of thing. It has to be done physically as well. Obviously, De Niro is very famous for doing it as well, but um, Tom Hanks has done it on a couple of occasions because he did it for Philadelphia okay. yeah, as well. Yeah. But it's just so shocking. It's almost horrific the way that it has actually been done. And... I think what they did was they filmed all the initial sequences and then they stopped the production for six, nine months in order for them to actually carry out this mm -hmm. body transformation of basically drinking black coffee for weeks at a time oh, and not really doing anything, really like sort of punishing himself and not exercising and things because the weight just had to mm -hmm. sort of start falling off him and everything. So, but yeah, that's, it was quite a powerful one that quite... It would be a bit up there in terms of these kind of films. I think it's always going to be sort of listed. I had to look at a few lists and it was pretty high up in quite a few of them as well. Yeah. Yeah, that him and Christian Bale are two people I always think of as, you know, Bale has quite famously piled on the pounds for, for roles. And obviously then you've got the the other extreme, which is like the machinist, mm -hmm. where I think he sort of, I think he said said he had like one apple a week. And basically cigarettes, and that was it. And he, he yeah. is it's the same as Tom Hanks. The rib cage is just like 
it's got its own shadow. I mean, it's yeah, that's a very, very extreme body transformation and obviously a very, very good one as well. Yeah, and like I say, it is not good for you to do that. So, no. dear listener, do not try any of these transformations in your spare time because it will end badly. Pretty much everybody that's done these things to their body have ended up with medical problems. Christian Bale says he can't do anything like that again. He's been advised, um, no, don't do it. So is it Tom Hardy that has said that he has basically, if he kept putting him so now he, he obviously got huge to play Bane, they yeah. basically said that the weight that he put on or the muscle and the bulk, his frame couldn't support because he's only about five foot six. So yeah. he was like basically destroying the bones in his knees because he bulked up so much. It was like crushing him, which is insane. Mm -hmm. Yep. Because he did that for the Bronson film as well, didn't he? He yeah. got completely jacked for that and he was like totally different type. And then when you see him and things like... Uh, what am I thinking here? He was in Layer Cake, and he's just normal size. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Now, Layer Cake's one of these films that there's so many people that you know. I always forget so that he's in that, yeah. People I've gone to uh, have pretty big careers have been in that film, and you don't think about it because it's like relatively minor roles and stuff like that. And but yes, we, we diverge yeah. from where we are. Now, we're on to your last choice. Yes, and I have gone down the conventional body horror route for this, but maybe not the film that everybody expects. So my last film is uh, Julia Ducournau's Titan, mm -hmm. which we obviously discussed in a pod. You know, this centres around Alexia, who as a child was in a car crash, so she's already part metal by the time we meet her as an adult. She models at car shows, and she's obviously very popular, but she has a little fetish for cars themselves, machinery, and so she ends up basically having sex with a car and gets pregnant by the mm -hmm. gear stick, I'm assuming. And so her character goes through this huge transformation where, yes, she is pregnant, but as the film progresses, we obviously see, like, you know, her pregnancy belly stretches and you can see, like, metal poking out from underneath. And this is a follow-up to Raw, I believe, for the director, which in itself was an absolutely insane film dealing with sort of bodies and how we treat human bodies. And so this, I thought, was the perfect sort of... You know, we've gone from two childhood films to one that's a bit more sort of adult and serious here. I thought this was the perfect body transformation and also had a, a strong female lead. You know, it really leans into practical effects. You get to see, you know, the, the motor oil leaking out of her body and the metal pushing through her stomach. And it's very graphic and it's very dramatic. And actually, a, again, a really interesting and different film that if anyone wants to check it out, we absolutely should if you're into that sort of practical effects body horror type of thing. Yeah, it was a very good film. Really enjoyed it. And the, the whole car part of it was excellent. Yeah, I really, really liked it. And I know we've talked about it at length during the previous pod, but it's always worth bringing up again. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I always like the fact that we can bring it up and we can probably wedge in your husband into it as well because he really likes cars and <laughs> can, can continuations that he oh he definitely denies. whispers sweet nothings yeah he definitely yeah. whispers sweet nothings to that car so far he's not <laughs> pregnant yet though so we'll see how it goes <laughs> <laughs> oh man All right. my last choice is what you would regard as a horror film but not like sort of totally gross out horror it is the 2018 remake of Suspiria the Luca Guadagnino film there is a scene in that film where well to, to give you the background of the film it's about uh, a coven of witches who basically are running this dance studio this dance academy and they're yeah. churning out witches into their coven and there is a seen in it where one of the characters finds herself trapped in this room and another character is in another room doing a rhythmic expressive dance and as she's doing this the, the character that's stuck in the other room starts to do some of the movements that she is also doing but they're done in a grotesque way in a fairly horrible way and her body starts to transform because of all the sort of connotations of the, the movements and everything 
and it is truly horrific. Her body completely changes, and it's not just a visual thing; it's a uh, audio and an oral thing as well because you're hearing all the bones moving in unnatural ways and muscle and sinews cracking and oh and the screams from it as well are completely horrible now this isn't a jacking up or losing weight this is just changing a body in a way that it should not be yeah. and it is completely horrible and it's completely gross but it's also very compelling watching it because you're thinking this is horrible, but I cannot take my eyes off of this. Yeah. How bad of a person all, am I? <laughs> of all the scenes in that film, though, because there's obviously lots of elements of body horror, actually. And mm -hmm. It's interesting that you've gone for that scene because I thought you were going to say something else. But that is the scene that always stands out in that film for me because I hate disjointed bodies, limbs mm -hmm. moving in ways that they shouldn't be moving and, you know, ribs. That, for me, yeah, that was horrific. But you're right, it's a body transforming into a shape that it just just shouldn't be in quite frankly but it yeah it's the sound more than anything else I yeah awful yeah yeah very good use of all mediums of film mm -hmm. and, that. and i saw it at the Sitges film festival it was the open gala film of the Sitges oh, film nice. festival so i was in the the big auditorium the the melia uh, hotel auditorium which seats uh, it must be about two thousand people it seats and wow. the the noises that were coming from the audience well oh, <laughs> this is going on I, bet. I, I know I've, I've <laughs> talked about the 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 Sitges Film Festival before and it's a very responsive audience they, they clap and cheer when there's a good death and things like that which is always really oh, nice yeah, and it doesn't yeah. take away from the films at all because it's that type of festival we're very respectful but when you were seeing stuff like that there was people going Oh, oh yeah. like genuinely, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and this is like a hardened fantasy and horror audience, and yeah. they, even them were oh yeah, it it was quite something, and it was something to see on such a massive screen as well. It's it's difficult yeah. enough to watch when it's on a TV screen, but when you're with other people and you're trying to sort of maintain some level of calm, <laughs> where all you want to do is go no, so, yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was good fun, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that is a really good choice yeah definitely yeah. as i say i i wasn't sure what scene you were going to go for from that yeah, film few, in particular few, but that's yeah. yeah that's a standout it really is right. so we obviously done talk threes but we had lists of well i mean if i'd really thought about it you could have probably gone into easily gone into double figures for various films so there's a a couple that we kind of cross over with and we ended up neither of us talking about it and went for the ones that weren't the obvious ones. So, I mean, there was another Marvel one there, which is the very obvious yes. Marvel one being the Hulk, which yeah. has been done a few times. The fact they actually show the, the body transformation and everything like that in that kind of film. But that seemed like a bit of an obvious one to me to actually do. But again, I am fairly obvious. I didn't go too far off of peace with that one so what were your sort of honorable mentions here so i had actually thought about beauty and the beast again sort of going down the child like childhood films often have people transforming into yeah. other things uh -huh. but yeah. if you think about beauty and the beast obviously you have the character of the beast who used to be a prince but then everybody else in that film was just a normal person who's been turned into a teacup or something at one right. point so and i think even in the, the cartoon version obviously the early 90 cartoon version and then you've got the emma watson a uh, dan stevens version which was the live action one both of the transformations from beast into prince i think are quite remarkable because usually it's the other way around but yeah that that again as soon as we said body transformations it's, it's one of the first scenes i thought of is, is when he transforms back into a human so childhood films have a you know there's a lot of trauma going on in there that nobody talks about <laughs> yes yeah of course there's obviously a lot of things like old horror films like yeah. the really old ones like werewolf yeah um, well, i suppose not so much dracula in a way but yeah more sort of uh, the werewolf trans transformations and all that, which have been done several times. The American Werewolf in London was a particularly good example of that because it used practical effects in such a way that we really hadn't seen before. Yeah. Uh, and obviously it was done again, Michael Jackson used the same effects as well for oh, yeah, that's uh, right. his thriller video. It was uh, the same, it was John Landis, I think it was. That's that, right, uh, yeah. Both of them, so... 
and it was directly from that that he took those sort of ideas and everything. So yeah, there was that as well, I suppose. But what else was on your list? I've got your list here if you need any prompting. So I'd also thought about The Fly, which mm -hmm. again is a very obvious body transformation. You know, you've got him basically falling apart at the seams as he finally becomes this, this brundle fly. I only saw that for the first time, I would say within the last five years. And it is incredible in terms of the makeup and prosthetics and practical effects and it's so visceral like the close-ups that you get of like the tiny little hairs popping out or even just like limbs snapping into a different position kind of similar to, to Suspiria and then obviously just this horrible rotting slimy sort of final version of poor Jeff Goldblum but it, it is a standout but I think it's it's quite an obvious again if you think body transformations I think most people would say the fly sort of fairly quickly yeah and basically pretty much the the most of David Cronenberg's films yeah <laughs> seemed yeah. there's a lot of there's a lot of body horror in his films yeah. Yeah. a lot of transformations and a lot of a lot of gunge and things. Yeah. <laughs> I know. You, do that when you ever look at a film and you're like, now, I can't remember what film it was you were talking. Oh, it was Ballerina when you said that they had the biggest blood budget. You look at films like that and you go, what was the slime budget <laughs> for yeah. this film? Because mm -hmm. everything's soaked in it. So, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's pretty gross, yeah. It's, uh, and obviously, that was a remake of a 50s horror film yeah. as well, which was far more sedate in the way that it was still sort of horror elements to it but it was nowhere near as gross out as that yeah. film and you could almost treat it as like something completely separate but yeah it was that was kind of creepy the original film version of that as well one that we both had on our list was a thing yeah the original one not the, the remake i think oh god there's a remake there was a well there's a prequel of a, a prequel film, oh, the, the one where so it, there was, yeah. it ends up where the obviously well, I'm I'm, try, I'm I'm mansplaining a prequel here. You know, <laughs> <laughs> the film ends when the, the original one starts. Yeah, uh, very good, John. Thanks, yeah. thanks for cleaning that up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. No, now that you're saying that, I do remember that. Yeah, that's a. Uh, I actually went to see, again as part of the Glasgow Film Festival. We sat in the snow. Mm -hmm. escape and saw that what a brilliant experience that was but again i'm i'm such a sucker for like a practical effect i love when you can it's such a craft and it, you know mm -hmm. obviously cgi is great and very realistic and all the rest of it but this to me was like it was such a you know up there with like you know alien in terms of what a joy to watch because it's so well done and it's there's there's a craft involved there which obviously the i mean the poor dog the less said about that the better <laughs> yes I, I think you're right. It's because it's down to the practical effects more than anything else, because CG couldn't have done what that did yeah. in the early eighties. I honestly think we should cover the thing at some point. We should do the yeah. thing, and we should do the the prequel thing as well. Yeah, I mean, to highlight tonight, the differences. I don't... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> is there is there big names in the prequel? Not particularly. They're all playing, I think it's, they're all meant to be Norwegians <clears throat> in the film, but they're all speaking English, obviously, but I can't remember offhand who's in it. There's a guy from NCIS Los Angeles in it, I think. Right, he's okay. one of the Norwegians <laughs> because he's blonde more than anything else, and he's, he was a, a, a bit of a named actor at the time. But yeah, I I think that would be a good one for oh, yeah. a, a conversation, sort of a quieter week. We could yeah dig out the and thing we'll get, we'll get hairy boy involved as well yeah oh you call him that as well now that's good yeah i'm, I'm glad yeah. it's not just me <laughs> <laughs> yeah the other ones on my list i'd obviously had the hulk and the fly i also had rocky three and i seriously thought about just putting that in there instead of suspiria mm -hmm. now that isn't a particularly obvious one because of the sort of history of the Rocky films, because when you see him in the sort of final fight scenes in all of the films, he's usually reason well, not so much the first film actually. He didn't mm. have the the full. It wasn't quite as oily and yeah. Yes, yeah. but in the third film, after he gets beaten by Clubber Lang, he goes away and starts to train with Apollo Creed, 
and there's the, the famous honest we are straight men but just really wearing really high socks really really <laughs> small t-shirts and small shorts which is what everyone looked like at the gym and love lies bleeding as well so yeah like exactly yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's the crop top that yeah. apollo creed so wears. masculine so masculine yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. but you quite wonder why the high socks then what's that all about <laughs> but yeah and the, the the there's a reveal when he comes in for the the start of the final fight and he's wearing a robe and it's actually quite subdued and then he takes off his robe and it does look completely differently he's, he's obviously lost a bit of weight and put on a lot of poundage and it's just amazing and again he's all glistening and oily but it's such a transformation. You're thinking, geez, man, that looks so good. You know, it's it's so good. And obviously, as part of the narrative, they mention that and they go, look at his shape he's in and all that. You know, he looks like a middleweight and everything. And, you know, and then the theme tune starts and some of the dodgy boxing scenes start as well. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, it's so funny because I always think of Sylvester Sloan as being buff, but you're so right. I always forget about that, that, they're, that they do actually make a storyline out of the fact that he goes away to get buff. Yes. Right. Again, because you just always think of him as sort of huge, but you're you're so right on that. Yeah. Uh, and apart from that, that was it in terms of this. Now there are obviously a ton of other films. Now, if there is anyone listening to us and actually shouting at the pod device of their choice at the moment saying, why did you miss X, Y or Z? Then let us know, you know, it's because okay. we would be quite happy to take a look at what you would think are the obvious choices in terms of body transformation films and like i say we could have gone down the route where it's just all horror and we could probably have done the top 10 of just david cronenberg on his own and possibly yeah. with a couple of sons films in there as well well i was it. actually thinking about possessor as well as one of the yeah. mm -hmm. the options and it's also just popped into my head talking about early horror the early 30s dr jekyll and mr hyde mm -hmm. yeah. that's a good transformation as well because he's in front of the mirror and it's all but it's like very quick sharp shots and then you sort of see the final that's a good one as well yeah, uh, and an offbeat one would be the Invisible Man, I suppose. Because <clears throat> yeah. he's yeah, he's don't think yeah, that. yeah, that's true. But that is quite a body transformation, and there's nothing left. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so that's it from us for today. We have had a blast. It's been a good discussion on Love Lies Bleeding and body transformations. Thank you very much for listening to us. If you would like to get in touch with us, we are on all of the social media channels at Movie Scramble. If you want to send us an email, it's podcast.moviescramble.co.uk. We will be returning in the very near future. We have a list of films that we would like to talk about and mix that in with some of the classics. We have at least one marathon still on the go where we have been talking we've been doing Hitchcock double bills we're going to get back onto that there is still one outstanding that I need to finish editing and get it out there but that'll be coming in the next couple of weeks so keep your ears and eyes out for that I think that's it for us today so I would just like to say thank you very much and we shall see you soon bye bye <laughs>